My name is Bob Gochi. I'm uh, a member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. I was born and raised in Arlie, Montana. And uh, I've been involved in a couple of businesses. Um, after college, I was in an insurance and real estate business until 1981 when I moved back to the reservation and went to work for the tribe, the tribal government. And I've worked for them since then uh, in the capacity primarily as housing director. In 1983, um, my brother and I started talking about doing a restaurant. We had done a couple of previous. As a matter of fact, my brother Larry uh, had the first tribal credit commercial loan uh, in Polson. He did the first Kentucky Fried Chicken in 1972. He was 27 years old and borrowed uh, 30000 from tribal credit and, and leased a piece of land where the, you know, the KFC is right across from Kentucky. Uh, and uh, I moved up shortly after and we put a pizza parlor on it then I moved back to Missoula and, and did the insurance and real estate thing and then he stayed in the restaurant business he went on and built uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken in, in uh, Whitefish Montana and also built what was Murph's used to be Murph's by the uh, by in Ronan there they had a, a restaurant there called Big Medicine and he owned the Salish and had the pizza parlor there and they had the bar. Uh, this all happened in the late 70s and early 81. Um, he bought the Driftwood and had that for three or four years. And then we wanted to do one like this. And so uh, we leased the building first and uh, hoped that we could ha raise enough money to put the thing together. I think we had $2,500. And we got open late in 1985. By May of 86, we were ready to kill each other. And since I had most money in the place, I ended up sort of by default being in this restaurant business. So now we have a family supper club that's, uh, this is our 12th season. And we've made every mistake that you can make in a small family business. We were undercapitalized. Uh, we were naive about the competition. And, uh, but we've paid for the mistakes and we're still here. 12 years later and we're still learning and it doesn't get any easier, unfortunately. Invariably people tell me we pronounce it wrong, which we always agree with, and I usually blame it on my grandfather's drinking habits. But if you say gochie with about eight beers in you, it comes out gochi. <laughs> but uh, the fact is, it, it's the French-Canadian pronunciation and there was a, about two or three years ago, I had a, right at this very seat, uh, there was a gentleman here from Rochester, New York. He was vacationing and, and he was with his son and, and I got to visiting with him and he said, by the way, how do you pronounce this name? And I said, we, well, we pronounce it Gochi. And I started to go through my explanation. Wait a minute. He said, I lived for 32 years next door to a, a lady and she just passed away. Her name was Mary Louise Gochi. She was from Paris, France and she pronounced it Gochi. So I, since then I've, I've sort of had, I've, I've had the right to say it however we want and not apologize for it. But I think it kind of depends on, it's, it's a re fairly common name in France and in Canada. And depending on the region, everybody pronounces it ease, uh, different, uh, different. Back east it's Gauthier. In Louisiana, you know, it's Gautier. And, uh, and the Canadians pronounce it Gochi pretty much. Uh, our family, you know, my mom uh, and dad our family was not, we weren't raised um, in our home to be as culturally aware, although we did participate, you know, uh, from early age, you know, we lived near the power grounds in Arlie and we always had booths there and we're, it was a part of our life and I mean it was just, we didn't separate our, 
I mean, like now, it's a distinct, it's almost like a distinct commitment, you know. And then, you know, everybody, all the kids that live there, 75% uh, of the kids in our area were, were, were tribal kids. And, uh, you know, we all did the same things. We camped and fished and, you know. Uh, so I think that, that the culture it, um, is, is sort of something you live with. And we've, and I've made a conscious effort to support, like the People's Center. I've been a board member and have supported it financially. Um, and for the members of our staff that, that pr practice, you know, uh, cultural activities on a more regular basis, we support them both at the Housing Authority and to the degree we have people here. And I think that that's really what separates us from county government is our language and our culture. So I think it should be supported. And, and uh, for those who have the interest and are pursuing it and who, those who are lucky enough to be raised and uh, this culture is a part of their everyday life from very small age, I think they're very lucky. And I think that they're, for the most part, very willing to share that. And um, it, it's, it's hard to relate um, beyond that, you know, financial support and spiritual support to the actual, you know, I mean, we, we try to hire tribal members when we can here. Um, but beyond that, it's, it's you know, in a business like this, it's, uh, it, it doesn't relate directly. Maybe in some of the way we look at our customers, you know, would have some, um, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't think you can be successful without being a spiritual person. I think it's very important to uh, keep your priorities straight. Just, just I think the way you treat people, the way you do business, the way you treat your employees, you recognize uh, them as, you know, their needs. Um, you know, I think it's all inter interacting. My overall philosophy is to be extremely clear to them what the, what's expected of them and then get out of their way and uh, support them, treat them with a lot of respect. Um, um, I think most people, I once read that the, the number one reason people leave jobs or change jobs is not because of money, but it's because of whether or not they're appreciated. And so, you know, we, whether it's here or at the Housing Authority, we, we try to let the employees know uh, specifically uh, when they do something that we, we appreciate. Go cheese. Yeah. Hey Keith, how are you? Well, welcome home, buddy. <coughs> sure. <coughs> sure. Uh-huh. Sure. Uh you, do you have uh, the tables and everything? That's a good example, though. See, how many of those calls like that do I miss because I'm at the housing authority? They don't. A lot of people don't even know I work down there. You know, you know, that I think that that's something we've always struggled with. You know, in a small business, when you, when I've always worked out, I've always worked at the housing authority, and so I've equated it to being in the ring with Muhammad Ali. You know, you're not doing anything the way you want. You're just trying to keep things moving along. And I think that, you know, you pay a penalty for that, because especially with a small business that happens to have your name on it, um, people expect you to be there. Because it's like, if you come here for dinner, it can be the same environment, it can be the same tablecloth, the same food, everything's the same. But if I'm not here and we're good friends, it isn't the same. It's like me having you to my house, but everything's great, but I'm not there, you know. And so that's, that's one of the things that we've always struggled with. And we've always thought that, hey, but, um, you know, in this community, I just, I can't make enough to do just this, you know. Our first full year of operation was uh, 1986. We did 152,000. Last year we did 430,000 in gross sales, and we're just a dinner club. We don't, we don't open for breakfast or lunches, so, you know, we've had good sustained growth, and uh, we've been, uh, we've been able to uh, anticipate cash flows better as time goes by and expenses which 
is really the most um, frightening thing for a new business. I mean, even if you think you have enough capital, almost always you you figured incorrectly. <clears throat> the uh, Early on, a good thing happened to me. The banker I was working with at the time, uh, and I had a good relationship, and he suggested that if I wanted to continue to keep this business operating, that it might be wise for me to take a course he was uh, recommending, and it was, it was uh, how a small business anticipates cash demands. And so you track uh, cash demands out 24 months ahead, and it's surprising when you get to look at it, you know, when you, when you predict how much income you have and what the expenses are from actual expenses, uh, it surprises you how much cash you need months you don't think you need it. And uh, he explained to me when he to asked me to take the classes that most small businesses fail not because it isn't a good idea or because people aren't working hard, but they've incorrectly predicted their cash needs. And if you have a cash crisis and if it's a vulnerable time, a lot of times you can't get credit when you need it. Our business is extremely seasonal. If I had this to do over, I'd do it in a, uh, I'd try to do it in a location that had a more year-round uh, economy. Polson, Polson's one of the toughest economies maybe on the continent because 10 weeks of the year, the population almost triples. And our volume is reflective of that. And unfortunately, you have to, um, you have to keep the staff on throughout the whole year. So, you know, we, five months of the year, we lose money. I mean, just, we just subsidize it or, you know, save money from the other months. And then in the 10, ten weeks in the summer um, is when we, we get ahead a little bit. But uh, even a little bit further south, I think Ronan or a place like that uh, would, would have a better year-round economy. Because everybody in this end are on the lake, builds up anticipating the tourists, and they think it's a longer season. It really is. And you don't know it until you get in to the business here. And you find out, really, it doesn't start until uh, after school's out and you know baseball's over, and that's the middle of June, and it's over on Labor Day. So you've got 10 weeks a year to really make it. I mean, you get a little bit, a little bit in the fall and a little bit in the spring, you know, golfers and whatnot. But for the, the intense months of those ten weeks, cash flow forecasting is key. And the better you are at it, the better you your chances of survival. And if you use honest figures, and, and the better, the more reliable your data is, the better. But even like I say, this is our twelfth season. This past winter some things happened that we could not predict. For example, uh, in no previous year had we ever paid over $300 for snow plowing. This last year we paid almost $2,000. Uh, propane, which we use a tremendous amount here with both the heating and air conditioning system and our cooking, prices uh, uh, went up about 50%. That wasn't something we could predict or we really had any control over, but that was you know, a significant increase in, in our projected expenses in those areas. Uh, you can pretty well, you know, if you've been there for a while, you can pretty well predict what your income is and you have to be able to, you know, be really aware of, of the changes. But we had a, you know, a, a new restaurant open here, a significant one this winter. And so we adjusted our projections for 97. And uh, so far through four months, we're just about what I projected. Um, you know, it's going to be a lot leaner this year, and, and you're going to have to be more careful to watch, you know, the, the controllable costs. That's where the, it gets you is the controllable costs. You can, sometimes can't do anything about the not controllable costs. But in the restaurant business, is a lot like farming. You, you might have a cooler out, and if you have to buy one, you're looking at a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars, and it could be the time you, you you know you don't have the money. So. It's, it's, it's frightening that way, so you try to have a reserve, and, and if, if you're lucky, you'll have problems when you do have the money, but um, you can't ever predict everything. Well, we, since we've opened, uh, tried, tried to do something a little different than everybody else, and that is, uh, you know, we've, if, if you would have come in here the very day we opened, and come back today, the table looks exactly the same. Uh, the same silverware, the same dishes, the same tablecloths. What we try to do is, is recreate each time somebody comes the same experience they had before. And it's uh, a serious attention to detail. For example, when our, our dinners are served, 
they're, the items are placed on the plate the same way. The, the confirmation of the steaks or prime rib or shrimp is exactly the same. I've had the same suppliers and I think that that consistency in this business is very important. So if people try your restaurant, uh, if they like it, then the next time they come back it's the same. But we have, uh, you know, we, we've, we've done a couple of things. We try to keep the environment uh, as much like a home as we can. I mean, because we, we, since this is a family business, we try to equate people coming here to having people to our house. And so, you know, you, you make sure that it's no different than having a dinner party. You know, you have a tablecloth and uh, f cut flowers and a candle and you play music that you like and you hope your guests like. And as far as I know, we're one of the few places in the area that plays a lot of uh, traditional jazz. We play uh, Billie Holiday and Frank Sinatra and Ella Fitzgerald and you know, it's, it, it's not what you hear in a lot, most places up around here. And, and people like that. So our, our niche has kind of become, uh, you know, older folks, a lot of people that spend six months here in the summer, um, they, they like to come out, uh, uh, you know, special occasions, rehearsal dinners, um, birthdays and anniversaries are kind of our niche. Um, but I would say our, the clientele is on average much older than a lot of other restaurants. We, you know, it's not the kind of place that's, that's conducive to bringing kids because we don't have a lot of choices for them. And it's, um, but we welcome them. They're, it's just, you know, that's, we don't have many kids in here. Uh, the tribe um, has been very supportive. Uh, you know, a, a couple of the programs like the college and also the Job Corps uh, through the years have always uh, you know, supported us through graduation activities like for S SK uh, um, job, the Job Corps, they send down their graduates for graduation dinners and they, they do appreciation dinners and uh, you know, uh, by and large the tribal membership has been uh, very supportive. Um, you know, it's always a question we have since, since sometimes the politics get so interesting here with the Indians and non-Indians in Lake County, that we all we always wonder if 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 you know when it gets the rhetoric heats up like with the recent issue with the airport, if it has an effect because I'm visibly you know I mean I you know with the housing authority in here and most people know that that I'm a tribal member that works for the tribe, and but there's no way of knowing for sure whether or not that either helps or hurts your business. Pol City of Polson has a small airport on the. Uh, west side of town <clears throat> that's, that's naturally limited by the river and the highway. Uh, it's a certain size and it can't be expanded and a good deal of the south end of the airport and the, and the approach is tribal land and it's been leased uh, for a nominal fee to the airport board for a lot of years and that lease expired I think five or six years ago, I don't remember exactly. And um, there was never any resolution to the lease and so this year the Tribal Council uh, uh, using the CFR as a guide said that we have to appraise it in charge you know just like we do our own membership unless we can show some significant social reason why we should um, you know reduce the, the, the lease and, and uh, considering they were paying I don't know ten dollars a year or something and they it was appraised at forty-five hundred dollars a year and there was eight or six or eight years of back lease payments due, it became a big issue between the city of Pulse and, and the people interested in the airport that used it and the tribe. And the tribe uh, uh, seemed like, like they were not willing to uh, modify their position and, um, and I guess rightly so. I mean they apparently had the CFR behind them and uh, Finally, they did, uh, they did work, reach an agreement uh, for a, I think, 10-year lease at current rates with an option to, re to renew it for 25. But, you know, a lot of people don't understand that the tribe is a government and, uh, that, you know, I think for too many years the tribal council always supported community efforts and gave money and, you know, I know that they've given, uh, you know, 30,000 a year to the YMCA, for example, for the last couple of years. They've, Supported baseball fields, the job course, then millions of dollars worth of community projects, and I think it's always been assumed that you know the tribe will just do that. And uh, as as other differences become more focused, and I think as the tribe grows and and uh, claims 
uh, can, more jurisdiction that's rightfully theirs, uh, some people aren't happy with that. And uh, you know, I'm not involved in that policy-making process, but all of us that live here are affected by it. And uh, so I think that you know, when, when things get political and heated up and rhetorical, I think you know, the average person in the community suffers. And especially if you're a visible tribal business, um, you know, you just want, you just have to wonder if it has some effect. If there's some people that, that don't support you. I think the role for small business in that issue is is to take a position and make it known because you know people know who they are. Um, but I think if you live here, you have a role. You know, whether you're a small business or a community member, I think it's in everybody's interest to. Uh, you know, try to get those things that are that we agree on to move forward, and stay away from those you know complex jurisdictional issues. Leave those to the you know the recognized government entities. I mean, I, you know, I you can have an opinion on, but it, there's not much we can do. But those areas that we can agree on and can work in uh, commonality, I think we ought to. And I think it affects small business because uh, the kind of people you want to attract and retain will will appreciate those efforts. And I think that if, if it's, you know, if it's, uh, you know, put aside the rules and, and go after the resources and, you know, build as many uh, subdivisions as you can, I think that, you know, conversely you, you attract people that maybe that don't, won't appreciate what we have here to begin with. And, uh, you know, I'm always proud to tell people that the tribe in, in the 30s set aside the you know, the face of the missions as a wilderness. I mean, that's a tremendous gift to this community. Nobody talks about it much, but you can't help but drive down Highway 93, and even if you don't recognize the gift from the tribe, you recognize the beauty. And, uh, you know, those kinds of things that are going to benefit my grandkids and everybody that lives here grandkids are, are common issues that should be shared, in my opinion. A good thing, and it's a bad thing. Um, but my dad was born and raised in Ronan, and uh, you know he was French, and, and his mom was a tribal member. He was enrolled. You know, uh, her mom was born and raised in Saint Ignatius, and it goes all the way back. But my mom's family came uh, to the reservation in Arley in the early 20s, and they were full blood Swedes. So I look less Indian than a lot of people. So you know, in, so in some ways, that's an advantage. If if there's people that are really truly prejudicial. You know, you, you don't have that resistance up front, but and sometimes it's a disadvantage too. You know, especially within the tribe, I think that uh, there's a lot of people in, in our position. But we've always, uh, you know, made it known that we're a tribal business and we support the tribal activities and we try to support, you know, tribal athletics and you know the different programs that take place and whatnot. But um, you know, a, a few years ago when they were having this issue over the retrocision. The tribal council talked about a boycott of non-Indian businesses. Well, there's a lot more non-Indian businesses than there are Indian businesses here. So the negative effect is, is it's a challenge for tribal members to only support tribal businesses. Well, it's like, it's like saying, okay, if you're a non-Indian, only support non-Indian businesses. And, uh, you know, so I, I, don't, I don't know if I, I support that kind of, you know, discussion. I think that hurts everybody. I think everybody that lives in this valley and everybody that loves it and everybody that calls it home have the same interests. You know, they want a quality education, they want a clean environment, they want an opportunity to make a, a good living. And uh, I think those are common issues. I think the threat to everybody is one we're not focused on, and that is uh, what's coming in 10, 20, 30, 40 years, the people that are not yet here. And I think we should be working together to, you know, continue to preserve areas here and, and recognize those common goals. Well, I think the first thing that has to happen in, in areas that are immediately affected by growth, such as uh, wells, septic tanks, uh, where subdivisions are allowed, there has to be more cooperation between the tribe and the county. We don't, for example, at the Housing Authority, uh, we, we administer the Indian Health Service funds for wells and septic tanks, and we don't get records from the county. And conversely, they don't get records from us. And probably 40% of the growth and the water and sewer is tribal or on, tr on trust land. And it has to affect 
the permitting and the planning from the county side. But yet, to me, that's a common issue. Every, you know, it's one aquifer. I don't care whether the land above it is, is trust or fee. And there needs to be a co cooperative effort. You know, it doesn't have to be a recognition necessarily or a, a, a submission, but just sharing of information so that when planning takes place for subdivisions and wells and, and septics, that, that uh, you know, all the information is shared by everybody. That's one example. Uh, I think the wetlands and uh, creek bed preservation, uh, you know, bird habitat, those things, you know, this valley is uniquely blessed with the way it's, 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 it drains and uh, it has, you know, world famous habitat. And I think that's a treasure that is, is very fragile. I think in our generation, if we don't respond to that, that it'll be lost, the opportunity will be lost. You know, if, uh, if subdivision and roads and, uh, and there isn't comprehensive planning. And I'm talking about fish, wildlife, you know, the tribe, the county, everybody that has an interest should be sharing that goal. The concept of looking forward seven generations, and I think, you know, the more you think about it, the, uh, you see how, how much sense it makes in, 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 in a very uh, intelligent way because um, it, it really removes immediate decisions from immediate benefit if, you know, for, for, for um, if, if you look about the long term and the impact of, of every action, um, it's a tremendous way to, for our, our valley especially, to plan and think. And so, you know, I probably, um, in our planning at the Housing Authority, we probably don't have it in front of us as much as we should, but we always are reminded of the need to make sure we're thinking of seven generations. Small business is, is a, let's say, a decentralization of resources to small business is a way to cost-effectively assure prosperity. And let, let me see what I mean by that. When the tribal council, and, and again, I mean, this is not criticism, but when, when they see themselves as a business entity and they create an environment in which the tribe itself can pursue business interests, for, for example, like the resort or other business interests as such, rather than creating an environment which individual Indians can be successful, I think is counterproductive. Because I think that an individual who has a tribal member that has their own resources at stake will pay much more attention to the activities of the business than somebody who's getting paid a salary regardless. If you're getting paid, if you're working for a, 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 you know, an entity like the tribe, and if, particularly when it's a diversification, I mean, there are some things the tribe's very good at. Our natural resources is, is a model. But we haven't had the best success consistently in business because a business takes a different psychology. Good government doesn't necessarily translate into good business skills. The goals of government are different than the goals of business. And I know the tribe has made, our tribe has made a couple of attempts to separate those. And uh, I don't know if, you know, when the council changes, if the philosophy carries through. But I think eventually they'll recognize that they're, they're, they'll be most successful if they create an environment and support and give tools to individuals so they can be successful. And let me give you an example. <clears throat> we employ seven tribal members or descendants here in our small business. And we have about $100,000 a year payroll. We pay health insurance on the full-time employees. And we've taught countless young people, uh, we've given them their first job. Um, you know, we, we pay interest to the bank. We, we support suppliers. Um, in addition to a tremendous number of opportunities to support the community, the YMCA, uh, you know, softball teams, bowling teams, Heart Fund, uh, you can go on. I mean, every day we get an opportunity, there's, there's a program that wants support from the businesses. And I think it's frustrating for small businesses because we're, we're always asked to support them. And then Saturdays, the people jump in a car and go to Missoula, you know, and shop at Costco or whatever. So I'm, I'm for, I, for one, am supportive of seeing uh, Walmart coming to the area. I think we've already been 
uh, I think we already have an erosion to Missoula and Kalispell, and I think that if this Polson Walmart is done properly, it'll bring people back to Polson. I really do, from St. Ignatius Plains, and you know, people that go, might go to Missoula, well, they might come up to Polson if, if there's you know, some opportunities. Not to take anything away from the small businesses, but as we learned this winter when this new restaurant opened, uh, competition really does is good for the consumer. And uh, I think they'll find that that's true there too. Um, Small benef businesses benefit a community by also setting role models. I mean, there's a lot of people I think that I've had a lot of opportunity to give advice and help people or answer questions or uh, give references. And I've helped a number of businesses with grant applications in the past. Uh, I can think of two Indian-owned businesses that are still in business that I helped write original BIA grants for that were successful. And so once you learn how to do it, you know, most, most people are willing to share that knowledge to help another tribal members get started. And I think we've got a long ways to go. Uh, Indians comprise about 25%, 25 to 30% of the valley's population, but I think we're only 8% of the businesses or less, 6 or 8%. And so we've got a, a tremendous gap to fill even just to keep uh, you know, pace with, with uh, what, what the numbers should be for Indian-owned businesses. Well, I think a good example, and again, I'm not being critical, but was this negotiation on gaming. They negotiated not on behalf of the Indian gamers. In other words, the, f there's no benefit, the way I understand a compact, and I've never had gaming here, and I don't plan to, but from what I understand, is there's no benefit to being a tribal member on a reservation here, an individual gamer. You're treated just like a non-Indian gamer. The negotiations, the tribal council, the tribe had their attorneys and whatnot, focused on benefits for the tribe itself and in the, in the, the businesses, you know, like the resort or any other casino they might own. Now, there's an argument made for that in a broader sense, but again, it goes back to a philosophy is it's the government's role to be in business and compete with individuals or to support them in an environment. I think they had an opportunity to negotiate, why shouldn't an Indian have a, a benefit on their own reservation? Um, you know. I, I don't, maybe there was an attempt to do that, but the final result, it was no different. I think that, um, I think the tribe can do some of the things that, that it is doing. For example, supporting, uh, you know, to the degree they do and the college, your, your efforts, uh, supporting education and encouraging it and making job opportunities available for people in specific skills. I think that's important. I think uh, identifying business opportunities. I think they could do more there. Uh, you know, suppliers, uh, lumber suppliers, uh, you know, we need more tradespeople that are tribal members. You know, we have a lot of focus on advanced education. I think we need more skills. You know, as a housing director, we have a hard time finding qualified electricians and plumbers and, you know, other skilled positions that are, that pay well. They're good careers. But you know, we, I think we get this in our mind that you know, if edu advanced education means a four-year degree in, in something other than a, a trade. And I think a two-year trade degree, uh, there, there could be some identification of needs. Prior to 1962, there were virtually no federal dollars to help with Indian housing of any kind. In spite of the fact that the, the Snyder Act of 1921 gave the responsibility to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And not only did they give them the responsibility, they gave them an outline of how they could provide housing in four ways. There, were no, there, was, no, there was no money, significant money, appropriate in 1962, uh, a BIA solicitor uh, wrote an opinion saying that tribal governments were eligible applicants for HUD programs. And that began, most, our housing authority was created in 1963. And, and as were in the next two or three years, 185 other Indian housing authorities. And what that allowed the tribes to do is to, by ordinance, set up a corporate charter uh, and create a housing authority with specific powers. And it was at arm's length from tribal government so that it could soon be sued and enter into agreements with the federal government uh, called ACCs for dollars to build housing. 
with those ACCs and dollars for housing came very rigid rules, rules that were promulgated based on urban housing needs. They tried to apply those rules to Indian reservations and by and large it, it's been a failure. With one, one I mean, it, it's been a failure in solving the housing problem. It's been a huge success in getting houses built. Uh, between 1970 or late 60s and, 19, and now, uh, HUD has provided funding for 80,000 houses in Indian country. Many of the houses uh, are not what you'd want to live in, but, but virtually all of them met a need that wasn't, wasn't being met before. And when I got involved with housing, we understood the dilemma of, of HUD being the only resource. If, 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 if you uh, went to America as a whole and HUD was the only housing resource, this country would be woefully underhoused because there isn't enough money and the program doesn't limit, doesn't allow families with moderate to higher incomes to participate. Well, what was happening in Indian country, uh, there was a commission st uh, established in 1991 by the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs that I was uh, served as chairman from 91 till 93, and we held hearings all over the country in Alaska and Hawaii on native housing issues. And it was determined at that time that America as a whole relies on the federal government to subsidize 4% of its housing. In the Indian country, it's over 51%. But the bad news is, is the other 40-some percent is not being filled at all. It's still an unmet need. So virtually the only housing in Indian country was uh, HUD housing or housing that was, was modest and just built with families with no financing or trailers. And so we discovered at that time that there were 28,000 Indian veterans living on reservations across the country that had earned the right for a VA loan. There wasn't one VA loan on the books. 28,000 Americans that had that, that, that many of them were disabled, many of them had, you know, not to count the number that, that had died. No VA housing was on any reservations. We met with the Farmers Home Administration at that time. They had a very popular program called the 502 uh, subsidy program for low and moderate income families. Uh, as a matter of fact, the one here in Lake County was a service area, so flat had a reservation. Guess how many Indian loans they had? Zero. We had a meeting with them in Billings and talked to them about why aren't you making more Indian loans? And they said, we thought HUD was taking care of the Indians. So one by one, we went through different agencies and discussed with them whether or not they would be willing to try to make more Indian loans. And we discovered some very serious impediments. Uh, banks particularly are, were deathly afraid of uh, leasehold mortgages they were afraid of tribal jurisdiction on reservations. Uh, the, re the remoteness of reservations and their proximity to banks didn't make it, uh, it usually was out of, uh, outside a bank's lending area. And the bottom line is, is they didn't know how the examiners would treat trust land loans. And so whenever banks by their nature are conservative, they have to be because they're so carefully examined. Um, we found a willingness and an interest in making uh, banks making mortgage loans, but n none in, none being made in any volume. So we worked with uh, with the National American Housing Council and uh, uh, Representative Doug B. Ryder and wrote the 184, Section 184 of the uh, Gonzales-Cranston Act in 1992 uh, authorized a uh, 100% loan guarantee on trust land. First time ever. Uh, and we were surprised that, that the funds weren't being spent more rapidly, but then we found out that, that to make those loans, uh, most, most mortgage companies that were buying the loans from small banks and reservations required a title insurance, a title policy, which is not yet available, and all there is is, is a title status report, but you can't get title policy. And a lot of the reservation areas could not, could not receive, um, could not get fire insurance from an a AM best rated company. And so they were non-conforming. So then we looked to the Federal Home Loan Bank and their non-conforming advances to members, and we started to have some success. Now the 184 program has been modified, and I think we're, we're at the beginning of a real um, burst of activity. We went to the Montana Board of Housing and asked them to set aside a million dollars in first-time homebuyer funds on, for trust land loans, which they did. 
we're still having trouble getting it all drawn down because, for example, here we have a lot of qualified participants, uh, but tribal credit gives great rates and the process is simpler to get insured loans. There's a tremendous amount of paperwork and expense involved, appraisals and not. People are still learning about that. But we're, Flathead has is, is got more opportunities than any other reservation in Montana or probably North or South Dakota. Um, I always talk about my friends at at Rocky Boy. They have 612,000 acres of trust land. Every bit of land on that reservation is trust. They have 500 quality jobs in, 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 in little Rocky Boy community. Every Friday when they get paid, there's a stream of cars in the Haver, 40 miles away, where they cash their checks, they go to the Kmart, Walmart, the grocery stores, buy clothes, everything they want, and come back to the reservation. Not one checks cash there. There's no tribal businesses there except for a small video store. It's a perfect example of, 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 of the absence of lending. If those people were able to get mortgage, mortgages, a lot of them in mutual help that have significant equities, they, could, they would have the cash to build cattle herds, to start barber shops, uh, corner grocery stores, uh, you know, clothing stores, all of those things are needed. And I think we'll see it happen in the next 10 years. But it's so obvious there, and that's kind of our test case. We've had some we've, we Federal Home Loan Bank assistance uh, guaranteed to them for down payments. And when we get that rolling, I think we'll make significant progress. Well, I think, I think uh, mortgage lending is, is a good, everybody understands. It's not as complex. You know, commercial lending, it's far more sophisticated. Uh, the cost of funds are higher because the uh, security many times is, is limited to, it, it's not like a home that has a broader demand. So, uh, but I think that so many of the fundamentals, the security process, the level of trust, level of comfort with the court system, level of comfort with uh, commercial code that's being worked on, those are all components that have to be in place before the mortgage lending works well. And once they're in place, then I think it's natural once relationships are developed. If you've had a mortgage with somebody for five years and you want to go in and borrow some money to do a, a commercial endeavor, you have, uh, I think, a good chance of, of, you know, you've built a relationship. Conversely, it'll never work. Almost never would somebody make you, without ever having a mortgage in your name, would they make you a commercial loan. So I think that, that um, I think mortgage lending is a groundbreaker. And I think it's... Uh, it, it's, it sets the pace. In and of itself, if we would start meeting the demand, in Montana alone, it's two to 500 houses a year in mortgage lending. Uh, if, you, if you multiply that by the number of jobs that are needed to build those houses, the building materials, the cement, the opportunities that are inherent in that, um, I think that it, it fosters economic development. There's been an effort for the last year or two by Gerald to get uh, economic development representatives from, from the Montana tribes working together to develop a standardized uniform commercial code. And has gotten good, uh, I think, the response. He's worked with the National Tribal Justice Center and the University of Montana Law School. They held a um, conference in Missoula in March, late March. And I think, by and large, everybody agrees that, that this pro, uh, project is badly needed uh, to give a, that level of comfort we were talking about to lenders for a standard. So if, if, if each of the tribes in Montana adopt that uniform commercial code and, and supports it in their court system and through their tribal government, then it will, lenders won't, like a, a bank that does business in Montana, won't have to go in and learn each tribe's process and code uh, so they have a level. I mean, when Fannie Mae started wanting to buy 184, they sent ordinances to tribes to pass before they do business. It had all sorts of waivers and, and really objectionable uh, components. This way, there's a standardization, and if the tribes will lean on each other to support that through their court system, then it will create, I think, a tremendous amount of opportunity and it will bring more lenders. And more lenders into the mix means better rates. If there's more competition, there should be better rates. If there's only one lender, 
you know, he's, he, that, that takes the step, he's going to charge plenty. It's education. I think the tribal court systems are still developing. Um, you know, we ha there, was a, there was a joke, uh, you know, on one of the reservations in Montana for years that you could not repossess a pickup on this particular reservation. You know, well, th that was well and good, but the bad news is, is you can, if for somebody that legitimately needed a pickup, could no longer get one financed. And so I think, uh, I think and sometimes there was so much abuse um, and takings from Indians that there was an overreaction once the tribe, tribal councils and courts got the, the power to kind of, in some cases, there was an overreaction. Now, I've never heard in our court uh, a, a non-member that had a civil issue that didn't feel like that was heard fairly or that had a civil claim against a member that wasn't treated properly. And it's, it's been a real source of pride uh, to me to know how well our court system functions and how fair it is uh, and based on the issues and not the people involved. But what it does is assure our membership that they're being heard fairly and that they're giving every opportunity of under the law. I don't think that was always the case in the past. I think our members uh, too many times were, were taken advantage of and I think that's, that's been a fear in some of the tribal court systems. And the other reality is, is, is some of the tribal governments are still developing and there's not the stability maybe that they would like or that is conducive to the kind of government that we recognize as good government. I think the Crows are a great example. Uh, in many ways, people would look at them and say, boy, that's a tough way to do things. But for them, it works. And who are we to judge how, how it works for them? I mean, well, I'm, I'm not familiar, but it's, I understand that they, it's a true consensus kind of government that, that is, uh, there's, uh, the show of support's just in numbers. And, uh, People vote by siding up in a room, and uh, any issue can be brought that way, and any member can vote. And uh, so, th so the decorum may not be what we're comfortable with, but it's certainly not for me to say that's not a that's not a good way to operate their government because they've survived, their culture is alive, their language is alive. I mean, they have their problems like all of us do, but you know. A lot of times people say, boy, you know, Salish, you guys are so progressive. And, and I say, yeah, we, have, we do, you know, we keep bank about, uh, accounts well and, and we have efficient government. But also we have a threatened language. So there's a price to pay, you know, for that. And I, I think that, uh, I, I don't recommend everybody has the same kind of government, but I do think that you have to have a standard if you want in a court system or they have to accept a standard if you want to have lending any, any significant numbers, unless they're willing to do it themselves. But if they want outside dollars or leverage, uh, the lenders cannot, by law, you know, risk stock, shareholders, stockholders' money or, or depositors' monies uh, unless, unless all the pieces are there and the loans are perfected as are required by the bank examiners. I've, I've, I've been of the mindset for a long time that one of the areas that the tribe, I think, really misses, not only our tribe, but all tribes, the boat on, are banking and insurance. There is no federal, um, I should say there's none, but states have reserved the right to, to regulate insurance companies. And without specific legislation banning it, tribes would also have that same right to formulate and develop regulations so that insurance companies could, could start up and operate under tribal law. And if they met the reciprocity states, you could even do car insurance. I don't think the tribes have spent enough money taking advantage of their sovereignty to do that. For example, in 1986, uh, the National American Indian Housing Council uh, had an insurance crisis for its 70,000 units, the members. The insurance coverage we had was being dropped. We had th three or four months to get new coverage. And we asked HUD if we could try to form our self-funded pool. And we got permission from HUD to try. And I was on the, the three-person committee that created our self-funded pool. We dropped our premiums in half. And today we have $35 million in assets. And we insure 70,000 Indian housing units. And not only do we insure them for fire and liability and extended coverage, but we have a safety fair. Um, 
We've got Indian claims adjusters, we've got Indian uh, operators at our national office, and it's been hugely successful. I think the same could be said for, if, if it's one, it, without creating any risk, we already have a resource we're not yielding anything off of, and that's the financial strength of the tribe and its members. The tribe itself is, is if you look at it as a corporation, would be one of the biggest corporations in Montana. But then you have a thousand members who, who also have a tremendous amount of financial strength are, that are working here, not to count the ones that, that are working, that live here, that are also tribal members. And without any risk, we could, we could pool those resources and make funds available for our members to help them build it economically and, and show a good return. Right now, the return is going to non-member institutions. I think the Ronan State Bank, for example, has done a tremendous job for the tribe. But we paid a price for them to do a good job over the last 50, 60 years, whatever it's been. And I think now the tribe uh, should seriously consider uh, to what degree it, it can expanding its tribal credit program or a project we've been working on to do an employee credit union that would be expanded to give some relief to tribal credit, make more consumer loans at a, at a you know, a competitive rates. And um, that's going to happen. I think that uh, if you had a tribal credit union that was familiar with the membership would be familiar with the lending problems and familiar with uh, and totally comfortable with, with leasehold, totally comfortable with tribal credit, excuse me, tribal court, um, I think that you would have a loan committee that would be made up of peers that understood the, the, the community and I think there would be a level of, of encouragement, uh, more like family, and a source of capital that is badly needed that I don't think can be met anywhere else.